Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Um, tonight's topic is farming in Vermont is a sophisticated business. Um, ben Kinsley is here. He's uh, founder of Imperium Advisors, specializing in public policy solutions, grassroots advocacy, communications management, and government information management. And he's a co-host and co-producer of Vote for Vermont. Ben, good to see you. Thank you, Pat. And our special guest, we, we, you've been on before. I've been on before. Yes, I'm back. Have. He's back for a second go-round. Anson Tebitz, who is the Secretary of the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. Thank you very much. Great, great to when be here. When did they add those other things on? I don't Who know. Knows? But the most important one is food. Yes, that is. It's that's a, a really good one. I food like and markets. Don't forget that's that. Our, that's, my, that's my favorite thing anyway. I know. Um, yeah. So anyway. Um, I'm going to be a little transparent here. Much of the sh this show is focused on an article that I read in Vermont Business Magazine, and I would really encourage you to read it because um, it's very interesting. You'll learn all about the title of this thing is Ensign Tebbets, the Quintessential Vermonter. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. I had to look it up, but yeah. exactly what quintessential means, um, but that's good. And it was written by Joyce Marcel. Yes. Yep. And, uh, and I got a little help from the agency's website here, but that's most of the questions will focus on what was said and written about Ensign in that article. So I would hope you would pick it up and read it. Yeah, I had a great time with that's Joyce. Good. She spent a few hours at the agency and nice. it was a, a nice conversation. She's been doing those cover stories for more than a decade, I believe. Oh, really? And uh, very in depth and she spends a lot of time uh, with you, which is kind of what we're doing here, spending yeah. a little bit of time talking about... And then you sweat about, to see what that... Well, like. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the finished product looks yeah. like. I'm still here. I'm still, <laughs> I still hold the title, so the I'm okay. The hasn't read it yet. Susan sent me the article, by the way, my sister. Oh, yeah. She said, here's something from about Ensign. Yeah. I said, oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, not that this whole show is kind of about you and what you do and your agency and all that stuff, but um, we, we ask all of our guests to talk a little bit about themselves, their background, um, you know, why they're, uh, what they're working on that's interesting, um, that kind of thing. So what do you, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, um, I grew up on a dairy farm in Cabot, um, which I, I still live there. I still live on the land uh, with my family. Um, from there, um, I went to school. I went to, I was a big Red Sox fan, um, and I listened to the radio, yep. listened to WDEV. Um, all hours of the day while milking cows. <laughs> and that sort of prompted me to think, well, maybe I want to go into uh, radio Great. or closer to Fenway Park, actually. And uh, went to school uh, at Emerson College, which was a communication school. Yep. And from there, I was fortunate enough to graduate from there in 1987 and then came back and my first uh, paying job was at WDEV Radio. Great. Uh, working there in uh, reporting news. Um, so I did that for a while. 1994, I went into uh, television, uh, working for WCX, right. and I worked in Rutland for a year. That part I didn't know. Yeah, I worked I in Rutland. Um, I guess I didn't make a big enough impact in my, my storytelling. <laughs> I didn't know that. It, if I was down in Rutland, I, I'll have to review my stories yeah, down so there. You have to, because I didn't you know, Rutland. What was yeah, you yeah. No, but I, I loved... Um, I love that experience because I didn't have a lot of knowledge of Rutland in southern Vermont. I also go down into Bennington and also oh, over to Brattleboro okay. and Wyndham County in Windsor County. Yeah. So you covered a territory, not necessarily a beat where you had a specific thing. So yeah. uh, Rutland was fantastic. Um, strong community like it is today. Right. Strong community. Um, uh, and I had a grand time there for about a year. But then when someone left the Montpelier Bureau up here at the State House, yeah. I could get back closer to the cows. Uh, and so I worked out of Montpelier and lived in Were Cap. Were you running a farm? Yeah, yeah, I was still milking. I was still, grief. I would come back on weekends and help my parents um, milk and so forth. And That'd I, get me home real quick. Yeah, go milk the Friday night. After a long day of working. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Friday nights I'd get in the van and, yep. and the, only, the only issue was if I had breaking news in Rutland, I had somehow had to get back there quickly uh, oh. to cover it because I was also the bureau you were shooting your own material so you were the photographer as well oh wow so you had the gear but I always had the gear with me right uh, and uh, I only got caught a couple times having to I remember going there was a, a bad crime in Stockbridge I think it was Stockbridge and uh, it was Christmas Christmas Eve or something oh. like that and it was a serious crime and it, during an ice storm so I was wow. white knuckling back uh, to get the video 
that you needed back then. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I only got caught a couple of times. <laughs> um, but I did learn how to take pictures and do the whole thing. They called it one man bands. That's what they Excellent. used to call them. Very nice. So then I did that for a while, and and then I left. I had about 14 years in the Capitol Bureau yep. in the State That's House. Right. I used to cover you when you yes, were you did. motor vehicle yes, commissioner right. when you corrected that, um, whatever was yeah, going on over there and exactly. got that place back in shape. Yeah, that was a good job. And that labor, you were also, with, yeah. I probably covered you then, I probably yeah. interviewed a million times. All good news, of oh, course. Good, of course, I was on, uh, <laughs> okay. what is it you guys did on W? Oh yeah, you can uh, quote me. You can quote me. I yeah, did you, ever, did you ever still have your mug? Yes, I do. We have it in our cabinet. Yeah, the, you, that was that was the gift. If you agreed to be on the show, got, well, this is our mugs, but I gave so many away, and then yeah, um, they're very nice. Then I went and repriced them, and so yeah. we're not doing that anymore. No, <laughs> but at, I tell you, at CAX, they're under lock and key. Oh, sure, because so they disappear. They, so you had yeah. to. So that was a big deal. Hmm. If you were allowed to even get the key oh. to go in there and get the guest. Oh, I did have one. I have. Yeah, it, so, so you keep it, and yeah. and they had one for a while that. I uh, had a gold rim, and people and were you, putting it in the microwave. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't do that. Oh. It explodes. Oh. It makes them look like a stalactites and stalagmites. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Because the whole inside just burns. Yeah, that's so good stuff. Yeah, exactly. well, that's great. You Something still have... to remember, WCAX, yeah, right? You, you can quote me. Yeah. <laughs> you can quote me. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you this real quick. I know um, I was supposed to be interviewed by, uh, by a radio station in Rutland, in the Rutland area. And I got caught up in an accident, so I'm trying to make it on time. I stopped at Peg Flory's house, and I said, Peg, I'm supposed to be interviewed. I said, can I use your phone? <laughs> so I sat in her living yeah. room, and she's feeding me answers. Uh, <laughs> it was a good interview. Yeah, and they that sounds like something I that was. Peg would do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's there. I'll help. Don't worry. Well, that's so, wonderful. It was cool. Yeah. Was cool. So one thing uh, you didn't mention that's more recent past, or actually current, uh, I guess current news. Um, you have a quite the pro prolific uh, Twitter feed, <clears throat> which I definitely highly recommend anyone watching Thank you. to follow that. There's a lot of really, really well, interesting guess, stuff on there. We know it's, it's been keeping it busy now um, is ticks. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is the summer of, so I've yes. been, I, every, I've gone for four walks, and every time I've come yeah. back from a walk recently, yeah. uh, I have I had, a, I had a farm visit today, mm -hmm. and I'm at the office, and I'm at the computer, oh, gross. and I'm like, something's, I feel something crawling on me, and it's relevant to what we do because we have an entomology department at at the uh, agency. Yeah. So there, we go out and do a tick surveillance. So we're out in Ooh. the springtime, looking for ticks, and then we test them in case they are carrying the Lyme disease, and we're working with the health department. But lately, I've been uh, photographing them and getting video of them crawling on me and, and posting them on Twitter, and then oh, putting a link to people of what you're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to. Um, you know, take frequent showers if you go right. out. The other right. thing is to put right. your clothes on high yeah. in the in the dryer for like 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and make sure that that's it, a good idea. You know, you just all that. But I think the main thing is making sure uh, every time you go for and don't walk in the tall grass if you can help right. it. I think I've been in the tall grass too much lately. Yeah. Right. You know. And do you, so, have, you have your animals, although yeah, your yeah animals, and them. I have a white dog, so it's easy to spot a tick on yeah. a white well, dog. Well, I'm just gonna say I put white sheets on my bed all the time now. I've got all these fancy flower mm -hmm. matching stuff. No way. No. I put white, just when the dog gets on the bed, I want to see if he's bringing anybody with him. And that's, <laughs> and that's when we go out for surveillance yeah. and, and do them. We do drag a white sheet across the uh, fields and it yeah. does pick up the ticks. Oh my God. So you can see them. And then we put them in. So today's uh, adventure Shoot. was I went downstairs a couple floors in the agency and they put it in a thing and they're going to tell me what it is. The, the, oh. uh, Oh. The expert wasn't oh, was there. It to, in, was it in your? Was it it, in no, I was just crawling. It hadn't. It hadn't been on very long, yeah. and it hadn't it attached itself okay. uh, to yeah. me. Uh, but this particular year seems like we do have a lot of ticks. They're everywhere. Do we yeah. have those kind that don't that make you not like meat? I don't know. I hope not. I hope that would be, that, that would that just would be horrible. kill me. That would, that would be horrible. <laughs> just put me over the edge. Wow. Can you imagine? Wow. It gets you, makes you nauseous when you. When this is true, I know that they had on television. When um, when you when they get bite you, you don't want to eat meat. Wow, that's that would be that would be. Mm -hmm. I had lamb sausage Forced today. <laughs> I, that was wonderful. So, so, I used to uh, um, I used to live in uh, Fishkill, New York, for a couple of years. I lived there, and um, they had literally the highest tick concentration in North America. Uh, mm -hmm. 
in Fishkill, New York at that time. I don't know wow. if that's still true or not. But, um, and we would be just outside in the yard and come in with like three or four ticks on us every yeah. single day. That's disgusting. Every yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. So just kind of something that we got used to. I think we're going to have to get, you know, just, um, someone said I was a tick magnet. <laughs> is that a compliment? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Something that, else. That's yeah. a chick magnet. That's tick, cool. Tick, tick magnet. magnet. Tick magnet. So. What a great thing for your recipe. <laughs> All right. So back to the show. Yeah. <laughs> so in this article, you they said farming in Vermont is a sophisticated business, and that's a quote from the article. And I just wanted you to explain how things yeah. have changed these days for things, our farmers. Things uh, we ask a lot of our farmers now. Uh, uh, we ask them to, uh, you know, take dairy, for example. We ask them to produce a quality, safe product. Uh, we ask them to comply with uh, water quality regulations mm -hmm. and food safety regulations. Uh, we have a public that wants to know more about what they're doing and how they produce it and how they're taking care of their animals. Mm -hmm. uh, technology, of course, is a huge part of what they do. Um, we have some farms that have transitioned to um, using robots to milk the animals, uh, which is very oh, sophisticated. Cool. Um, and that could be a small farm. I was at one in Washington recently, and they have about 100 cows, but they have two robots. Uh, and it's a game changer for them because it changes their quality of life. Uh, no longer do they have to be in the barn at a regular right, schedule. Right. You know, you've got to milk the cows at least twice a day, mm -hmm. you know, usually 12 hours apart. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to be in the barn at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. They could be doing something else. They could yep. be doing else, something else on the farm. They could be getting their kids ready to go to school or child care. Right. Um, same thing in the afternoon. Uh, this uh, family um, can now attend a sporting event if they wanted to right. or go to a, another quality meeting, time. quality right. time. Right. Um, and of course, labor is difficult to get. It's, it's difficult to find people who want to um, do that type of right, work. Right. So this uh, robotic system is helping, um, you know, smaller, medium-sized farms. They are on bigger farms as well. You may have four or five robots. Well, you um, were telling me when you were on the show last time that, and we've got there's fewer. I've got notes here. Fewer than two thousand farms left in New England, and about half of them here in Vermont. But you said, which I found fascinating, and I've, re I've quoted you, that even though we have l so much mm -hmm. less farms, we actually have the same production, if not more, because yes, of and that's, uh, and technology. And technology and, yeah. and, and quality and feed and yeah. care and so forth. And that is, you know, the, a cow may leave, cows may leave a certain farm, but they may even go to another farm. But production has yeah. uh, remained stable, and, and it, has not, it has not changed. Um, and that's you know we're uh, that's part of the issue as far as we the reason farmers are not getting as much for their uh, their product mm -hmm. now is because we have too much milk across yeah, the country. I read that too. Does somebody yeah. not regulate that? And say well, it's a hold off. And... No, it's a it's a federal system which I think maybe five people in the world understand. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> pretty complicated yeah. a system based on and in just a perspective. Farmers, dairy farmers are paid for their product after they deliver it, and they don't know what they're going to get paid probably f at least a month later. Wow. And, you know, not many industries would, would right. do that, but that's the way the system is developed, and there's, I think it's so complicated, no one's figured out a way to uh, correct it or change it. Um, but it is a complete um, global, national system, so we can't go it alone in Vermont. We have to be part of the federal system. Um, you know, our pluses are we have tremendous uh, markets that we can deliver our milk to. We produce, you know, the majority, like 70% of the milk for New England is produced in wow. Vermont. So we've got Boston, and then we got yes. New York, we got Washington, right. Philadelphia, big markets, yes, big population. Yes, I buy Booth Brothers right in uh, sure. Cape Porpoise, Maine. Wonderful. Yep, I so do. that, yeah, so, so that's, um, you know, that's part of the system. But yeah, we are, uh, and... Um, about 15 or 16 percent of all the dairy that's produced in the United States is exported to other countries. So when we have one or two swing, it can mm -hmm. really impact mm -hmm. what our farmers paid. Price of milk is inching up a little bit now. We got a little bit of encouraging news after four years of depressed prices. It's starting to go back up a little bit, and part of that is because um, too many of them have gone out across the country. 
Um, this particular case, Vermont's in the same situation as New York is in, and Wisconsin right. is, right. you know, a big dairy state, and uh, Wisconsin is going through uh, terrible times um, uh, with their farms. They have a lot of small farms that are yeah. that are not going right. to, not That's going really to survive. That's sad. I know in yeah. Berlin, I think we had seven or nine, and now we've got right. maybe two or three, and and one of them's a. Um, not cows, it's just it's vegetables mm -hmm. and, and um, flowers yeah. and stuff like that, but, yeah. which is great, but yeah. it really reduced the number. Right. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about tariffs later, but what are the, um, the major um, international markets for, for milk in the United States? We send a lot of um, some of our whey product, uh, whey powder to China. Uh, we also, Mexico is one of our biggest, uh, mm. th they love our dairy, uh, Mexico. Uh, Canada in, in some aspects. So all those sort of three countries that we're hearing a lot about exactly. um, We're in the middle. I mean, uh, for example, Agamark slash Cabot um, uh, had uh, and has markets in China where they sell some of their um, uh, milk powder. Another thing that's happened is, I don't know if you've heard about the swine flu. There's a swine yes. flu going on right. and a lot of the animals in, um, in China, China are, being, are, are being slaughtered, but they were being fed uh, some of our our whey powder, oh. so they're not asking us for as much as that, yeah. as because there's fewer animals, they don't need as much feed, so that's been an impact. Huh. Um, so there's a lot of things that are not really working in everyone's yeah, favor it doesn't right take now. Much does it? Just but, like you said, one yeah, thing. Yeah, um, you know some of the other s countries that have big exports, like for example, New Zealand is a big dairy state, and they they export about 96 percent of their product. Uh, to wow. countries, yeah. uh, you know, like China and so forth. But things like weather events, big weather events can yeah. really change. You know, they have a drought in uh, New Zealand or, mm -hmm. or it's really wet right. and they don't have the production to meet their markets and the U.S. can step in and, and try to help that. So it's, 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 they're not kidding when we're in a global economy. We, you know, we kind of think, well, in Vermont, right. we can right. ride it out on right. our own. No. Um, it's some, it's, some can, but not everybody, but we're tied to a, mm -hmm. good or bad, we're kind of tied to a... And a they're a remarkable people, the farmers. I, as you're, they're, they're just always, my impression is, helping each other and supporting each other, and they're all in this together. And when I've been around farmers and mm -hmm. meetings and stuff, they just... Yeah, they go, I mean, they, they uh, um, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. up against a lot. We've had a very wet spring and early summer, uh, which has challenged them. Yep. Um, but. You know, when a, um, you know, the farmers are the ones that are in their rural areas, and we know Vermont, um, we need more support and help in our rural areas. Mm -hmm. And if a farm goes out in the rural area, it impacts not only, you know, the land and what's mm -hmm. happening there, um, they're on the fire departments, they're on the rescue That's squads, right. they're on the select boards, they're on the school boards. And when that happens, uh, it has a, a lasting impact uh, across the landscape sure. outside of that just immediate family. Yeah, uh, right. But um, they're strong and they adapt, and uh, you know. But this is the time I think anyone can uh, small gestures uh, really go a long way to help uh, help farmers. Well, we'll give a shout out to the farmers because they're just they're amazing. I think they are. It's a uh, it's a hard job for sure. Yeah, it is fine. Can't get me up at o o two hundred. We'll get you some robots. <laughs> yes. Come on, robots. Yeah. Can't button. use that one anymore. We we'll get you some robots. <laughs> that I could do. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> Um, so Anson, your uh, budget at the agency is about 26 million, give mm -hmm. or take, uh, and you have a, about 126 people um, working in the uh, department, um, or the agency, excuse me, and six departments, administration, food safety, and consumer protection, agriculture development, public health and agriculture resources management, Vermont Agricultural Environmental Laboratory, and agriculture water quality. Lots of things going on. Aren't you on tired there. yet? <laughs> yeah. I'm it's, tired just reading that list. Oh my God. No, it's, it's, uh, and that's one of the reasons I enjoy the job. It, it has a lot of variety in it. Yep. You know, we talked about ticks. That one day yep. we're talking about ticks. The next time we're talking about water quality. The next time we're talking about animal health. Right. Uh, we're talking about um, you know food safety. We have weights and measures. You know, we do gas yep. pumps. We do curds and whey. And curds, yeah. We do scanners. Yeah. Uh, so if you go into a store and and so, uh, it's a good. It's a uh, uh, it's amazing what goes through there um, uh, on a daily basis, but it has tremendous uh, variety. Yeah, uh, but you only have 
126 yeah, we're, people. Yeah. That's really lean, mean. Yeah, no, we're we're pretty we're pretty lean, yeah, and I we think so. and I and we have a culture there that um, we can do things lean and mean. I yeah. think maybe it's because a lot of us have ag backgrounds and we're kind of used to so doing a lot of yeah. cross go help this guy yeah again. yeah and you know yeah. and i think um and we have a tremendous staff that's uh, a lot of common sense yeah try to one thing we're trying to focus on is is uh, customer service which you know is you know your background For sure. is huge yeah um when they pick up the phone or send an email it has to be done um, you answer the phone you get the information you respond in a timely manner right. um you don't let it sit and that's what we've been trying to focus on over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I think, you know, every, everyone's name is up on the website with their phone number and actually what they do and not yep. those sort of odd names we give state employees sometimes, <laughs> you know. If it's, the no, B, right. if it's the B person, yeah. you should know it's the B right. person. It's not the, you know, some ag yeah, specialist. I appreciated your website. It was very detailed but very, you know, easy to get around and it was great yeah, to we're, we're see to, the name with the face. and yeah. And Mind cell phone numbers up there, yep. and, and we're you know we work for the taxpayers. That's good, good for you. But 126 is yeah. calling it close. You're, yeah, we're, yeah. That's so right. out of out of all the things that um, your agency does, what you know, what would you say impacts Vermonters on a day-to-day -day basis the most? Like, what's the yeah. what's the biggest touch point for a lot of? Well, folks? I think probably you know for, on the economic impact, dairy of course is is number one. It's about a two billion dollar year industry, so. If that infrastructure starts wow. to go go right. away, that impacts um, you know the feed dealers, the stores, um, the truck drivers, sure. um, and also um, we got to keep in mind we always have to keep in mind we are feeding people, um, and that's what we do very very well in America. We are very good at uh, producing a quality right. product, uh, and sometimes we ask our farmers to deliver it at a very you know cheap price right. and. Um, but I think that um, certainly dairy is uh, is number one, and and I think you know we we have assurances with um, food safety, so you know meat inspection is very important. We on the dairy side we have sanitation as well to make sure the farms are following yep. sanitation uh, practices. Um, you know, of course, water quality is a, a big new lift for us over the last few years with investments in water quality. Mm -hmm. You know, people. Are really in tune with all of that. Right. Uh, that's impacting them, you know. And and um, anything that anything that involves commerce or food, we kind of have a um, a finger in it somewhere along the way. And we are we are a, for the most part a regulatory agency to make mm -hmm. sure things. You know, about eighty percent of what we do is is primarily making sure that. Um, we follow the regulations for consumer safety and assurance. And you had made a comment in the article that because of the regulations, farmers are much more involved now than they were before, and that may be, while well, regulation mm. may or may not be a good thing, it's good that it's making them be involved and understanding yeah. what you're doing, what they're doing, what yeah. everybody's doing. And everyone is, I mean, it's uh, mm. probably in the 50s and 60s when there was the new sanitation stuff came in, right. it was a new learning curve for everybody, but now it's a matter of fact, they know what to be done. And I think as we get into the water quality stuff, yeah. I mean, we're farmers, you know, for the, they have to have um, nutrient management plans where they're going to spread manure. Uh, they're h highly regulated of times of year they can spread it. There's bans. There's you know you can't spread on snow. Um, all that kind of thing. No, none of it can make its way to a waterway. Um, they are inspected. Mm -hmm. All the large farms now are inspected annually. Mm -hmm. And a large farm I define is someone that has more than um, 700 animals. And we have about <laughs> we have about 35. Really? We have about 35 operations. Um, that are more than 700. The more than 700, wow. so they're inspected annually. Yeah. Uh, a lot of paperwork, um, and then we have medium operations and smaller operations. But out of the 700 of them, all of them uh, are seeing Agency of Agriculture employees uh, on a regular basis. That's great. You know? That's great. Well, and, and you know, we talk about uh, water quality. I, I have never met a farmer that doesn't want to keep you know, um, lakes and rivers clean. I think it's a lot of times is giving them the tools and resources to, to do that because a lot of this stuff, the preventative stuff, you know, takes time, resources, and money to, to implement. Um, and sometimes there are regulatory challenges like, you know, okay, I have a manure pit that's full, I have to spread or it's going to overflow and then I'm gonna get slapped with $20,000 in fees and so do I, 
do I spread even if it's not an ideal time to spread because I'm going to run into another issue? Hmm. You know, yeah, and stuff we're like always that. we're always trying to you know mitigate um, issues um, so we don't have those you know really serious environmental problems. And you know, everyone knows it was a very challenging year. Uh, you know, the public lived it. They knew that. Um, we could have maybe put the snow tires on at the end of November, but they should have been on the. Yeah, exactly. The, the big, they should have been. On, they should have been on November one because it snowed. Right. It, it snowed November one in Vermont, yeah. and he did not leave until the middle of April. Yeah, and we right. had snow in in May this year, and we had a lot of rain events. Um, and there's a lot of rules and regulations around that. And then with these heavier water events, not only is there manure in these pits, but water is going in too. Right. So that's another factor when we get these uh, rains that we're getting an inch or two at a time, yeah. uh, that's going into these holding uh, pits, which is a good thing. We want it all in there, but at some point it gets to the top where we have to decide um, we need to land, apply it at some yeah. point. I was going to ask this a little later, but now that we're talking about water, years ago the feds paid farmers to use Phosphate. That's correct. And most of the uh, water, um, Lake Champlain on the on the bottom, is phosphate, and so it was really a federal requirement that got us into yeah, trouble it, it, where it, we are. And the farmers just did what they were. And it's one of those, you know, we didn't know at the probably didn't have the know at the time what we were what was happening, right. but they were. That is that is right. that is fact, and that's one of our challenges with our water quality issue, we have a lot of legacy issues and it's gonna take a lot of time and it does mm -hmm. not take a very- I just don't think people know that and I yeah. think that helps to understand the dilemma that the farmers are in because right. you know they made us do it. And we're, you know, the practices we're doing um, now are, are, we believe are, you know, having a positive right, impact, right. but over time it's just gonna take longer and longer and longer yep. and time to get that right. out. But a small amount that's in the bottom, we get a good heat wave, right. Um, you know, and the, the old science gets to going, and, and we've got a, an algae bloom. So, oh. right, we've had we have algae blooms going on right now in St. Albans Bay and uh, and in um, Mallets Bay, and uh, it's a lot of that is just legacy phosphorus load, like that yeah. phosphorus that went in there years ago and has been sitting at the bottom, and then you get really hot days like we had last weekend, and right. boom. And we've had a lot of rain, mm -hmm. and of course. Uh, you have a really rainy spring and early summer. It, it just, you know, a lot of stuff is making its yeah. way uh, towards those things. So it's, it's uh, so. Okay, there you go. Lots of fun. Go ahead. Um, so we, most of us have heard the expression um, value added agriculture products. Um, could you explain a little bit what those products are and why they've become so lucrative in the marketplace? Well, value added, uh, for example, let's, let's take cheese. Yes. So cheese, my, my favorite, favorite subject. Yeah. Cheese. <laughs> um, so we have, we have um, you know, some folks, in, we take dairy, they want to sell, they just want to sell their milk directly to uh, a company. So they want to sell it directly to, say, to Cabot, and then Cabot will turn that into a value added product. So they're making, so we, we define value added. They're going to, the do plan is with, do something yeah, with it. Right. The plan is to get more money out of that as opposed to just selling it as a direct commodity. Um, so Vermont has been successful in um, the artisanal cheese operation. Mm -hmm. So there are farms that milk cows, but also make cheese right. and market cheese and distribute cheese. Great. And they think that's a better model for them. Um, they just they think it's a better uh, situation in their uh, in their family and their operation as opposed to just selling milk directly to someone and getting a, a well, paycheck must be for that. Every place I've ever camped, or Cabot is always there. Yeah, it's Cabot. Everywhere. Cabot is known, and Cabot is a very big company. They mm -hmm. are a major player in the in the cheese world, and they're uh, again like they're based on quality. This year they won um, best new product at the mm. uh, fancy food show, especially nice. food show in New York City. Right best new product um, and it was for their uh, five-year-old they developed a five-year-old cheese their 100 years this year mm -hmm. wow. and they wanted to have a special product from it so five years ago they tucked away some cheese and made it and this stuff is fantastic is and, really? and these yeah it's pretty good mm. and the judges determined this was the best product um, so there's value added we're, we're seeing it in uh, maple too um, mm -hmm. yep so we may have uh, someone that's uh, at one point was selling just uh, um, maple, um, but they wanted to, maybe I want a hot sauce and put some maple in it, so right. they're putting more value to that. 
so those are the type of things that, um, That's great. and we have about, a, I think about 100 people now that we're working in the dairy field alone that are working in the value added uh, yeah. aspect of. Uh, well, and things like, um, you know, like barrel aged uh, mm -hmm. maple syrup now, like, I think like run amok maple, those, those types of things are becoming pretty popular now. And they are, they are, and those, and those are the um, type of products that uh, the consumers are really responding to. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I think with maple, the word maple in it can't be bad. It's maple, right. and we're doing, and they're yeah. combining maple and cheese. One of the uh, one of the ones I, mm -hmm. I was at a tasting once, and they just took uh, cheddar toothpicks, and dumped it in the run amok. Um, Oh. Easy cocktail party there, no oh, fuss. Yeah. There you go. yeah, really. And it really, really so maple and cheese. So those types of things. Get a little things. heady topper on the side. Yeah, wow. yeah, my husband <laughs> is boring. Yeah, so yeah. there's there's a um, there's a I think there's a sausage that someone's putting with maple in with it. No, with heady topper in it. Uh, oh, there's a sausage topper. that um, Mackenzie just came out with with switchback in it. Oh, okay, it's a sure. Back Interesting. Sausage. Yeah. So yeah, but it's cool. all it's all based on. It's all based on quality and innovation, right. and and um, not it's not done without a lot of hard work, though. No, for sure. And it's, and I think everybody really respects the the seal of quality when Vermont when you got it on a product. Yeah. They expect the expectations are high. Yeah, they are. They, they are they very. It's going to be the best. Absolutely, and we're just going to keep um, trying to build on that. That's great. And. Um, how, how is the uh, relabeling of maple syrup going? Uh, we, or did we, you kill that? No, we, we're okay on we're okay on. Um, and you're talking about the uh, uh, sugar added, the thing. No, with, no, I knew that that time, but they were going to change the 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 way we label maple syrup. To no, they're getting rid of the grading. Get rid of the grading. Yeah, to call them yeah. something else. Yeah, that was done prior to when I arrived. Oh, okay. So it's so it's, it's out there. It's out there, and it's it's sort of a industry. The industry wanted it as a standard yeah. for other. Uh, comparable to, for, to other states of what mm -hmm. they were doing, and uh, but you're probably you're you're on the fancy, and you know all that. You yes, were used to the fancy yes, and the grade A and, yep. and so forth. Uh, um, but and then they they stopped the sugar. That is just well, that is Mother Nature at her finest. We there. prevailed on that, and yeah, that was um, that was the FDA wanting to put another label saying it was added sugar on. <laughs> But it's so, it's so added from what? Well, <laughs> That's exactly. what I want to know. It's all Mother Nature doing <laughs> yeah. her thing. But Not that really. one, uh, after 3,000 comments, which I think probably 2,999 of them from, from Vermont. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, good job. Prevailed because we are the um, we are the largest producer of maple in the United States. Yeah. About two million gallons. Um, this last year, which is an interesting year, uh, a lot of people thought it never really felt like sugaring because it was kind of a, you know. Yeah, you we know, never we knew what day it was. We knew what yeah. day it was, yeah, right. and it didn't feel, it didn't warm up enough, it wasn't enough sun, but we produced 7% more. Really great. This year than last year, yeah. and we did it in a shorter period of time. Yeah. It was like 35 days opposed to 52 or 53 days before, the year before. Yeah. So, Mother Nature, you just never know. Uh, there were, clearly, there were a lot of times where people were just boiling 24 yeah. hours at a time. And you can see, when you ride around, you can see a how many people are doing that? Whether oh, it's yeah. personal, because mm -hmm. you see all the the mm. uh, pipes going, the mm. blue pipes going through the yeah. trees, and you see that everywhere. People are really into it. Yeah, it's it's been another um, it's been another crop. You know, it used to be, it was a uh, another crop, for, say for the dairy industry, and mm -hmm. they put some taps in, and yep. it'd be another crop they could do in between seasons. But now it's there are some people that's exclusively what they're doing is, mm -hmm. is they're doing mm -hmm. they're doing exclusively well, maple. Technology has helped a little bit with that too, increase production. Reverse um, osmosis, uh, different taps, um, you know, tremendous amount of research. It's always, always being done on, on maple. Uh, the other thing I would say um, in the value add industry, and you kind of touched on, there's a lot of these almost like craft producers in the, the value add sector um, that are mostly making things like cheeses and um, you know maybe certain types of uh, Meat products or, or whatever. I'm thinking um, someone like Jasper Hill, who's mm -hmm. gotten a lot of notoriety even nationally um, as a as a craft cheese producer, or going toe to toe with um, producers in Europe, even uh, and elsewhere around the world that you know hasn't been seen previously. And we um, and those uh, and they're r relatively young companies. I mean, Jasper Hill is probably 15 years old oh, in right. the scheme. It's, so it's good. it's. Uh, um, and they have supported their region and, um, you know, they're based out of Greensboro and Orleans County, but the impact that they've had on the other 
aspects of agriculture in that uh, region are extraordinary. And I think one thing that, you know, could that that model be used in other parts of the state? We have other cheesemakers. Right. We have a cheesemaker in, um, in Reading that um, they pay a farmer, a dairy farmer, a premium if they'll deliver a certain product the way they want it. So, oh. so if they feed their animals a certain way and they deliver this as a certain quality, I'm going to give you a Great. premium for it and it makes the cheese that they need to make. Yep. Um, could we do more of that? Um, right near here in Websterville, uh, Vermont Creamery is undergoing a, a tremendous oh, expansion. There's that word, creamery, yeah, as cream. in maple. Yeah. Creamery. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't they, mention that. They are, um, they are putting <clears throat> you know, $15 million into that plant. Uh, they decided to stay in Vermont. Um, uh, they're owned by Land O'Lakes. There are goat oh. dairy, goat cheese, and um, cow dairy Great. as well, but they're making a, uh, a bigger line for butter, yeah. a stick butter that they're rolling out this summer. Right. Um, they're looking for more uh, farmers to milk goats. Cool. And um, you mentioned Jasper Hill. Jasper Hill is also uh, um, now, now has some goats, and they're goat putting cheese. on oh. goat cheese. Um, so there's um, there's a trend there with uh, another option mm -hmm. for farmers if they want to do something. And uh, Vermont Cream will tell you that the model is you need about 300 goats um, for for it to be the crunch of the numbers. Right. Uh, but they're recruiting and trying to get more people to, because they need uh, as they expand, they're going to need more um, goat's milk to meet their demand for is there, cheese. Is there help from the state if, for expansion and, yeah. and even starting up? We have, a, we have a program called the Working Lands, and Working Lands uh, does offer um, business planning, but also grants for infrastructure. Oh, good. So if you needed that certain cooler or that certain machine or right. something that gets you, that adds um, to your bottom line where you can add more employees or you can keep more animals on the land. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's well received and, and it's very, uh, very popular and so it's working lands. That's good. Because you look, at, you look at the equipment that they've got on their fields and you're like, that's yeah. a whole lot of No, money. it's very, very, uh, uh, the uh, equipment and, yeah. and it's very, very expensive, yeah. those capital like investments. That. Well, I think we would be remiss not to mention uh, Vermont's most famous value-add product, uh, Ben & Jerry's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. right? um, which uh, gets sources all of their milk from the St. Albans Cooperative, right? Yes. Um, which is in the process of merging or being bought yes. by, uh, is it Dairy Farmers of America? Yeah, uh, DFA, Dairy Farmers of America, which is based out of uh, Kansas. Oh. And they do have a, a presence already in Vermont. There are some members already that are members of DFA. Uh, but uh, St. Albans uh, is at the point they're in a transition mm -hmm. and they're asking their membership uh, should we merge yeah. uh, with DFA and become part of their organization. Uh, so it's a big decision for them. Yeah. Um, as you know the world moves there's been consolidation yeah. in a number of industries and agriculture is no different than... Well if they're allowed to keep their name uh, like you said the Land of Lakes they've got so much marketing and communication yeah abilities that could really promote and uh, and um, you know and that's uh, you know right now farmers maybe 10 or 15 years ago they could shop around and decide where they were going to market mm -hmm. their milk so if they wanted to be members of Cabot and yeah. maybe they didn't want to be members of Cabot anymore they could go to St. Albans and St. Albans if they wanted to go to um, DFA some of those options are not there mm -hmm. anymore because there's so much milk out there oh so these uh, co-ops and groups are not taking on new members. So there's a bit of risk. Mm. Um, there's a bit of risk. You want to hold your market. You want to be able to sell your milk to right. somewhere. Right. Um, and, um, and St. Albans, from what they tell me, didn't believe they had enough money to go back to their farmers because they're a co-op to ask for more monies to make, to make those yeah, right. investments that right. they needed to make to become mm. uh, more viable. Um, so it's a big decision that these, the St. Albans members have to make. Uh, they have to push the pencil and decide, but one of the re driving reasons is to preserve their market. I'm we should do a show on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, th I love all this stuff. I, I wanted to skip ahead a little bit, not to confuse, mm -hmm. uh, confuse us, but 
you had a first of a kind uh, summit, dairy summit. Yes. And I think I, before we run out of time, I wanted to talk about that and all the lessons you learned from that. And why was it one of yeah. a kind, unique? And we, we, it sounded great. We were at the point where, you know, we talked about earlier in the show, we talked about the federal system and yeah. how difficult that is to change. But we finally decided, well, what can we do? What can we do ourselves? Right. What, can we, what can we do as a state? What can we do as a group to change the conversation? What things can do we have control of? So our, we need to get everybody in the room, and we need to have an action plan. You. So what we did was we had a two-day summit, and I think the most important part of it, it was led by farmers, and we were able to get, um, I think, about 110 dairy farmers to Great. go. Yeah. Uh, we, we were able to give them scholarships. They were able to go and attend be there and they told us what they think um, we should be doing um, and you know part of it is they needed help uh, in engagement with lawmakers because they're make you know lawmakers are making policy right but they wanted they wanted a, a, a um, they wanted to invite one of the action items was they wanted to invite more policymakers lawmakers uh, onto their farms onto and the see farm. this right. is what a farm is because we all have a reception yeah. of what a farm is right. and we don't I mean they're all different they're all different family dynamics but they wanted to show them so that's one thing um, they wanted to explore um, could we explore different um, uh, partnerships I mean, we talked about a little bit about the uh, model where uh, if they contract directly with a milk handler pay a premium for delivering that could we have mm -hmm. more of those arrangements mm -hmm. around the around this state right. um, uh, Vermont Creamery was there uh, they talked about recruiting some members of uh, farmers if they wanted right. to go into a goat dairy. Right. Um, um, could that be an op option for them? Uh, the state would have to probably in work on the, you know, it's a different machine to milk a goat than a, than a cow, those type of things. Uh, there's talk about uh, payment for ecosystems. Uh, farmers, could we give farmers incentives to do environmental practices uh, that are above and beyond uh, there's the normal regulatory aspect. Could there be um, um, a payment for that? So those type of discussions, Great. and I think one of the biggest things I think it helped. Um, I think it helped the mental health a lot. Uh, it was kind of a depressing time, but I think getting a couple hundred people in the room saying, "What can we do?" and spend some quality time. And we they heard, find out they've got the same problems. Which yeah, probably helps. It, it helps, alone. and yeah, and and sharing information. And then we just didn't want to have a summit at the end of the day that said uh, we held a meeting and, yeah. you know, so we've got to come out and we've got to do some things. They wanted a dairy advisory council. They wanted dairy farmers to advise the agency of Great. what we're doing. So we're going to, yeah. we're going to do Good that. We're going to get some bus tours in September. We're going to show people this is what's happening on farms. Um, they wanted more public engagement. They wanted, they wanted help telling their story. Because the consumer now is asking farmers a lot of questions. They want to know how their animals are cared for. They want to know how their land is cared for. They want to know how the product is made. Um, they want to know the animal's name. I mean, they yeah, really. I mean, they really do. Really, I'm not sure right. I want to know yeah, the yeah, animal's yeah. name. <laughs> yeah, sure the line there. Not be named. <laughs> yeah. so, so they they want to know all this stuff, yeah. but they need they need support and they need help with that. So that's so those are just some of the outcomes. There's many more. It was um, one of them. I, I have to say, it was truth in labeling because yeah. of is it real milk or not? And I yeah. just, I think some of the, I think they've got a real case there. Some and of those things that they're pointing off as milk is they're not milk. And that is that comes from the uh, uh, the nut-based beverages right, right. that they're they're calling themselves milk. Um, we've made comments. The FDA is reviewing all that about you know what can they put on their label? It's just wrong. You know, it's it's so there's. They're capitalized. The farmers, they're capitalizing on the milk and the strong brand right. of milk, but a lot of this stuff does not even need to be in the cooler. It can be, a, and they put uh, it right next to the milk. Hmm. So it's it's one of those, and the the farm community just wants some, uh, you know, truth and labeling. For being sure. accurate. Well, know what you're buying. They want more yeah. pow like ground up. <laughs> nuts in water, I mean, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. oh not, yes, right. That's, yes. that's literally like, what it is. What right. is it? Pulp. Wood pulp in cheese. Do you know that? No. You know the cheese containers that you buy? Mm. Yeah. And, and it's got wood pulp. There's a name they use, but it means wood pulp. So when you buy that that mm. already chopped up cheese for the table. Yeah. Shredded cheese. It's wood pulp. Mm. <laughs> Just, so I went to the we don't wood buy that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But that's, you know, and the other one is uh, one of the other things that are the, they wanted us to encourage more whole milk in schools. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Well, they tried for a while up at the State House. I hope they're still doing that. They were trying to, it's in, and that's another one that's, um, there's, that's a USDA um, issue. There's a lot of uh, nutritional guidelines for that. Yeah. But, um, you know, we all know that if, if you're young and it's something doesn't taste great and it's not served properly, you're probably not going to go back to it. Right. So we have to make sure the milk is... That's why you put chocolate in it. Chocolate is good, too. Choc <laughs> yes. Chocolate cool. is a wonderful um, uh, replenishing drink after a sporting event, and I've seen mm -hmm. more soccer clubs doing it. I see more right. um, as, a, as an alternative to a sugary, you know, a... Um, a drink like that, but a chocolate is is, mm. is good for you. So it's good got a little protein and antioxidants. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Good thing. Yeah. Hot chocolate with this much whipped cream, which is also <laughs> dairy too. That's good too. And we had a we had a speaker that came, um, and he said, you know, the the dairy folks have got to give people what they want. And he said, you know what? If we want eggnog on the Fourth of July, and the public wants eggnog, give them eggnog on the Fourth yeah, of July. Sure. Don't just give it to them at Christmas at Christmas right? time. And That's so a great the, idea. So there's ideas like that, and 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 keep focused on what the consumer wants right. and what and, and they how to, how they want it, and and uh, they'll be okay. And his prediction was after this sort of nut phase goes through, there'll be it will swing back to dairy at some mm -hmm. point, and yeah. the industry needs to be ready to like give them something Good. that that uh, they want. I like eggnog in, something, in summer. Well, something that just occurred to me, um, you know, because you, you think about. Uh, you know, like the coffee industry right now, mm -hmm. like it's it's all like specialty lattes, right. and mm -hmm. a latte is two thirds milk. Yeah. There's just like a ver you look at how much espresso goes into a latte. Yep. It's basically milk, milk with a little bit of coffee. In and, it. Right. And, and for this, you the, pay three four dollars. Right, right. <laughs> but but it's like everyone focuses on the coffee and where the coffee came from. Why is no one paying attention to where the the milk that's going into that when it's mostly milk? Yeah. Like where is where is that coming from? And that's, that's one of those that I'm sure the milk industry is in front of all those uh, coffee producers right. saying, because you can, you can imagine the impact at one of these major coffee shops, uh, and if they're not putting milk in it or, or oh, yeah. using some alternative, right. what the impact it would have across sure. the board, because those stores are everywhere as you yeah, go now. They're angry. popping up everywhere. Yeah. Could you tell us um, what the Fantastic Farmer program is? I, yeah. I thought that sounded pretty Fantastic. interesting. Fantastic. We, we, from time to time, we, we wanted to go out and just visit with farmers to see what they're doing and mm -hmm. show, again, um, we're in an age where uh, farmers need to tell their story and what they're doing. Oh, cool. So this is, um, you know, not too far from what we're doing here. We're sitting yeah. around the table Chatting. talking about them. We may go into the barn. We may show, them the, show the animals. Um, we've done everything from... Um, we have an operation where they have uh, cows that are raised for beef, and then right next door, um, they have the shop where they sell the beef. And uh, so there's stories like that. Yeah. Um, they may be custom operators where they, um, you know, sell the hay and they're diversified. Um, so there, there are stories. Um, there are stories about you know Vermonters and and how they how they run their. That's operations right. and, right. and a lot of them are, are very good at what they do and they're willing to share their story yeah, at with the us. farmers market here in Montpelier is I'm sure in almost all farmers market they've got people from farms selling their their uh, their meat and I always buy from them because I just think it's mm -hmm. better yeah and, and, closer and, and, to the end and you product won't, and then yeah and you, and you probably will not go back to some of the other stuff you may see in other some of the bigger stores after having yeah, right. the freshness it's of really it. Good. Oh, yeah. You know where it, you know where it, where it comes from, and it's yeah. it's even uh, eggs I buy locally, mm -hmm. and they taste different. Sure, mm -hmm. um, it's just amazing to me. Sure. They just taste richer. I don't know what it is. You can yeah. definitely t if you like, you can definitely taste the difference between yeah. um, like local grass-fed beef yep. versus sure. you know something that you purchase at a large retail chain. Right. Like you no. can, Costco. there's a. Mm. There's a definite difference. Like yeah, you can taste I agree it. With you. Um, Anson, one thing that you were asked in the article uh, we've kind of been focusing on today is what you think the biggest change in agriculture is. And um, kind of, you had a kind of an interesting response. You said we don't slow down enough. Yeah. What did yeah. you mean by that? Well, I think um, I think in and it's not agriculture alone. We're we're quick to judge, and and we and we want solutions very quickly. Right. And 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 it's it, it, I don't, it's not blame. It's just the way we are. I mean, 
What's the world we, we live haven't, in? We haven't it? checked our phones yeah, in 40 <laughs> minutes, and this is probably starting to get anxiety. It's on my head. <laughs> <laughs> anxiety. We, we haven't, we haven't you know, right. checked our social media yeah. site, and I think it's it's kind of a kind of like in a microwave situation where, um, you know, we want it to be. We got the, we got something happened. Here it is. It needs to be solved right. immediately, and someone's to blame, and <laughs> and sometimes. Sometimes things just happen, and right. they're, they're mistakes, and you know we, we try to cor protect them, right. uh, correct them. But I just think it's sometimes uh, our expectations are, are really high, and I don't say that as an excuse. I just think that's the way that the world is now. It's mm -hmm. just that we're just really fast-paced, and everything has to be solved immediately mm -hmm. without thought. What is it, instant gratification? Well, and everything has to fit into a 30-second sound bite. Yeah. And, yeah, I right. think, <laughs> and I think that's one of the issues when you look at you know the thing, the the struggles that you know Facebook has had mm -hmm. with media and sure. how you filter media to get accurate information out there, and it's because everyone's listening for that instant gratification, that thirty second the sound, sound bite. bite. Exactly, and the problem is, is that reality is very rarely um, that simple. You, it, you can very yeah. rarely get the reality of a situation into a 30 second sound bite. And in agriculture, every, you know, a lot of people think one size will fit all. So right. if you, you identify, you could, this will work for this one. Well, we've got 14 yeah. counties, yeah. and every county in Vermont is different. Right. Every land base is different. You've got a family dynamic that's probably different. The finances are different. So it's, mm. it's a challenge where, you know, we all should go organic. Well, not everyone can go organic, right. mm -hmm. not everyone can be. You know, we're all going to have you know goat farmers. Well, we can't all be goat farmers, but there, right. if we give people enough choices and options, and and solid information, maybe that will lead them to a determination of what's best for them. Where do they go for advice? Do, do, can they call you? Yeah, if there's somebody have, on your staff have, that really. Vermont has a pretty good um, system for uh, business planning. Uh, we have a program that we don't run, but it's run through the Farm Viability Program, mm -hmm. which we participate in through the Housing Conservation Board. And they um, and they write business plans. That's so they'll right. sit down That's at the right. table with you and say, "This is what I want to do. Is this right. going to work? Where are my market's going to be? What do I need to meet my goals?" Um, so that's I think that's the most important that's thing great. that you know. And then just you know, if you're handing the farm over to the operation to the next generation, yeah. there needs to be planning with that. And and that's a big need that we have right now is trying to get the next generation of farmers. Yeah. Speaking of which, yeah. um, that in the article was one of the issues that you highlighted as a real problem, which is like in construction. What's the average age of construction? Like oh, 50 it's, something? It's in the 50s, yeah. 58 or something? Mm -hmm. Are young yeah. people stepping up or not? Well, it's, um, it's uh, it, uh, you know, every industry is having its challenge. But I see, a, um, and I have no hard data, but it's my anecdotal stuff. I do see a generation that's never worked on farms or land wanting to give it a try. Oh. And there's a lot of young people out there, um, and it may not be strictly in, in dairy farming. It may be they want to be in grass-fed beef, or they may want to, uh, uh, you know, grow vegetables. But I do see a, a, a movement where people are wanting to get closer to land and animals. Mm -hmm. And the the challenge we have is to make sure that they have the the mentor or someone that they can, can uh, get yeah. to or be able to afford um, maybe the land that's available for them to do their um, their operation because we all know land is very expensive in Vermont. Right. Um, anywhere it's very expensive, but I do see um, uh, an indication. I'm, again, no hard data, but I do see a, sort of this new wave of people that That's great. maybe they want to take a stab so, at. Right? And, we, and what we got to do is we got to encourage that, support that, and and do so they have know. things like internships and stuff? We do. Or? There's an uh, um, apprenticeship uh, that's run. Uh, for farmers, uh, it's not run by us, but other groups. Okay. So that's that's probably a good way to get started. Yeah, for sure. So before you dive full into wanting yeah. to own a farm, it's like, hey, I'll work it for a year and see if this Great. is for you or yeah, not. Yeah, because that's a lot of work to invest a lot of money in. Yeah. Um, one of the other things is we're kind of talking about um, industries that you're involved in, uh, specialty foods, um, and one of the fastest growing um, industries in the U.S. right now is actually. Um, craft distilleries. We have mm -hmm. a couple of those here in Vermont, and they're often being started and run by um, millennials. Um, it tends to be younger group, younger than the beer industry. Uh, and uh, we've got you know Stonecutter Spirits. We've got Bar Hill, who we were talking about before the show. 
um, both of which run by um, fairly young uh, entrepreneurs that are trying to get started up and you know uh, make something. And uh, so it's it's a pretty cool industry that you know seems to be getting a foothold here. And and that can tie back to the land as well because yeah. it, can we grow the grains right. uh, for those right. for those drinks? And that's that's happening with you know Barry Hill is mm -hmm. is trying to grow that. Um, we have an enormous amount of uh, wonderful bread makers in oh, Vermont. Oh, for sure. Could right. we source more of our grains, um, you know, right. our rice and all that yeah. stuff through that? And so that's didn't, wasn't there something we talked about up north where they were growing pods to use for um, to use for insulation? Milkweed. Milkweed. Milkweed, milkweed yeah. Their, are they still doing that? There's some research going on whether to use that. Um, um, you know, I mean, how cool is that? Could you put, you know, uh, in pillows and yeah. insulation and so forth? So there's some Just some activity. Who wakes going. up in the morning and says, "I think I'm going to take my milkweed and make"? I can grow <laughs> milkweed. I can <laughs> grow. <laughs> I can grow go. milkweed. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you. Seems well, like it's a hardy environment for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, goodness. I went to a, I went to a Sebago, a, a restaurant up in Maine, uh -huh. and the woman gave us a straw made out of corn. I said, who oh, the heck cool. wakes up in the morning and says, yeah. I've got corn, I'm going to make a straw. And that's, the, you talk about Perfect. the specialty foods, it's just amazing what usually starts in someone's kitchen. So yeah. they get it in the kitchen, then they get it to an incubator space where they, you know, maybe rent some space and mm -hmm. they've got the utensils and they're cooking. And then before you know it, uh, they've got their own space. And they're yeah. and they're uh, going to market, but that's how that's how they start. And, yeah, and it was perfect. It was it was solid. It didn't de degrade in mm. the in whatever we were drinking. Um, but anyway, like it, paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, paper gets all it yeah. just loses its its shape. It was it was great. You didn't didn't taste corn. It just was a straw. Yeah, Isn't that it's, cool? and it's a lot of that stuff. Um, the entrepreneurs and and um, tremendous energy and yeah. not without hard work. But well, I. Um, I know the folks who, we only got a few minutes left, but I know the folks who started uh, Potlicker Kitchen, um, and I met them way back when they were doing, um, you know, like the fairs, like and stuff, just locally, and now they've got an industrial kitchen, they've right. got, and they're right. doing like specialty jams and jellies that are like, some of them are beer infused or wine infused, they're pretty cool, pretty cool operation, and they've grown going tremendously. On. Huh? I wanted to, because we only have a minute and 15 seconds, you have to talk about my favorite show, for the birds. For the birds. 25 years this year. Yeah, I've been doing, a, it's on WDEV and WLVB, yeah. and I've been, um, you know, Saturday mornings and weekends been talking about birds. We spent about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Chip Darmstead from, um, from the Nature Center in Montpelier is right. the co-host with me. And but you used to be with Brian, Brian Pfeiffer. Brian Pfeiffer, Brian Pfeiffer was Pfeiffer. a fanatic birder, yep. a real thing. I'm the 4-H birder. I can hold my own. Uh, but just going up on the farm knowing the various birds, That's but it's great. been, it's the only sh job I have never changed. I've done it 25 well, years. Well, if it works, you know. 25 years. Um, but you said it started by, sort of by accident. It Somebody started by accident. Someone's, someone called the radio station, I don't know what this bird is, could you tell me what it is? 20 calls later, we figured <laughs> out it was a red pole. You know, but it, it piqued my interest. Like, yeah. boy, that's really popular. Well, obviously, people are interested. Well, twenty-five it, years. Birding is really fun because it has, um, you know, Vermonters love nature, and you can sit in your kitchen and be a birder, yeah. or you can hike the trail and be a birder, or you can travel the world and be a birder. That's great. And you can spend a lot of money on bird seed. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> but you got to take them in for the bear. Yeah, yeah. So it's, been a, it's been an absolute joy, and uh, and I'm, I, and it's you know, it's just some fun thing that's I do, great. and. I'm glad you're still doing it. It's been a joy to have you on. Thank you. Mr. Secretary. Thank Thanks you for Thank thinking you of agriculture. Us. Absolutely. Um, but thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, keep listening beyond the sound bites.